Sally B and the very competent hands of Peter Kuypers. A KLM 2017. captain when he's not flying the B-17. I think Bill Collett's in there with him as well. There it is, gear going up. B-17, a fascinating aeroplane. It started life as a maritime patrol bomber. The early ones were the Americans didn't really think there was a threat to them that would involve the use of a strategic bomber. So it was designed as a maritime patrol bomber to protect their coasts against any seaborne attack. I did have the pleasure some years ago for a TV show that I did, uh, Melbourne, I don't know whether you remember, to fly the B-17 and the Lancaster back to back. It's a fascinating difference was if you sat and flew along straight and level and moved the ailerons uh, in the B-17 as hard as you could left and right, the aircraft just rocked its wings. If you did that in the Lancaster, the aircraft would yaw massively in the opposite direction of your roll. It's a really ruddery aeroplane. The B-17 isn't. Ah, really? And it's interesting to mention Lancaster and B-17. A lot of people have compared them, saying which was the better. It's an unfair comparison. The, the B-17 was designed as a maritime patrol bomber. It was not designed as a long-range bomber. Uh, over for use over Germany, whereas the Lancaster was. The Lancaster was also half a generation on, so it was designed using the lessons that had been learnt from earlier aircraft such as this. It was designed to have a massive bomb bay. The downside of that, of course, was the main spar went through the fuselage, making it very difficult to get out of. Exactly. I remember stepping over it, believe me. So the B-17, as I said, it was designed to fly in a straight line in big formations and when they were flying in the big formations, they didn't make any attempt. Did you know that, Melvin, to avoid being shot at? No, at all. They used a, it was a very stable platform. Yes, you sat there, whereas in the Lancasters, uh, you would be jinking from side to side and you could do that because you had so much more maneuverability. And don't forget, as they came out of the factory, uh, Alex Henshaw. Alex Henshaw used to loop them. Yes. And roll them. And roll them indeed, yes. A totally different animal. The B-17 is very heavy, static platform. The length of them much, much more simple, very ruddily. As you see it coming past now with the bomb doors open, relatively small bomb bay, bomb bay. And of course it was that stability on the aeroplane that uh, is the reason that this particular one has, and several of the others have survived because they were used as aerial survey platforms for mapping France with the uh, Institut Geographic National, the French Ordnance Survey. And the only reason they were tired, retired was that there wasn't anywhere left to survey. They'd done it all so well, all they needed to do after that was updates on the maps rather than create new ones. These were used down at Creel, just north of Paris. And several of the ones that uh, are still flying today are ex-IGN aircraft. I know it's very much a detail, but if you look sometimes, this is again getting a little bit anorecky, you, you, you can watch it as it turns, and very often it will start to slip into the turn. It's not quite in balance, and that's very much that uh, flying style where you're not using your feet. So a little bit of underuse of rudder, you get a little bit of a slip in the turn. You see there the glazed nose, which housed the bomb aimer and also a gunner. There were two guns sticking out of the nose just behind that position. Two guns in a turret under the nose on this, the G version. There were two guns in the, uh, the, uh, the ball turret underneath. There were further two guns in the tail. Two guns sticking out either side of the re uh, mid uh, rear fuselage. And two guns in a turret above the pilot. Each one of those was a half inch Browning machine gun. An incredible firepower from these aircraft. Yeah, 50 cal. The 50 cal, indeed. The last remaining airworthy B-17 in Europe. Such a shame, I was lucky enough to fly in the French one before it was retired. Developed in the 1930s for the United States Army Air Corps, of course, in the competing against Douglas and Martin uh, for a contract to build originally 200 bombers. Well, the Boeing uh, entry outperformed both, uh, both of its competitors.
and uh, it also exceeded the Air Corps' performance specification, so a, a remarkable aircraft. Powered by four right uh, uh, cyclone radio uh, radial engines, each producing 1,200 horsepower. Had a maximum speed of about 287 miles an hour at 25,000 feet. Yes, right 18, 297 cyclones. So that's a total of 4,800 horsepower. And it'll climb to 20,000 feet, and that of course is fully loaded. Uh, 20,000 feet in 37 minutes and a surface ceiling of 35,600 feet. And range? Well, in 2,000 miles with 6,000 pounds of bomb. You don't want to be on the angry end of that. So there it is, living history, the sights and sounds of yesteryear. And if you're into aviation uh, history and poetry, ladies and gentlemen, there, there is a collection of poems uh, uh, available. And in one of them, uh, there is a poem written by somebody called Bert Stiles. And Bert Stiles uh, flew the B-17s during uh, World War II. He flew 30 combat missions and survived. But that wasn't enough. He could have closed the book there and gone away and done something else. But he didn't. He volunteered to fly the P-51 Mustang fighter cover for his beloved B-17. And he wrote a poem which basically was a verbatim account of the sounds in the aircraft, uh, the pilot talking to the gunners, the air gunners shouting out for combat aircraft coming in. And they found this poem on his dead body because he was killed. His name was Bert Stiles. He died flying the Peter Duran Mustang as cover for his beloved B-17. And it was called Serenade to the Big Bird, and Bert Stiles was just 20 years old. And ladies and gentlemen, the smoke is on now. This is in commemoration of the 79,000 Allied air crew that died in the air war over Europe. I think it's also worth mentioning that you should always try and see the original Memphis Bell, not the uh, one that was done in the 80s, but the one that was done with real footage, with real crews, flying the real war. Uh, 16 mm, millimeter camera film done by William Wyler. A fantastic film that will stop you in your tracks. Yes, if you haven't seen it, ladies and gentlemen, do make every effort to see it. So ladies and gentlemen, Sally B is going to be coming back in to land. Wheels coming down now. And very soon, once she landed, you'll see uh, an example of one of the things, potent things, that she was up against. Absolutely, the very M109 so. fighter. As I was saying earlier on, one of the things that she actually was definitely up against in that 1989 film. One of the very aeroplanes. So it'll be interesting again, once again, to see the landing, uh, whether uh, where Peter's going to be keeping the tail up. He tends to keep the tail quite high on landing. So are you going for a tail high or a tail low on this one? I think he usually uh, lands it and then pushes. He does keep the tail quite high. Oh, I'll go for a bit of a tail low in this wind. There's about 12, 15 knots. So I'll go for a tail low. Why not? The beers will be on me. And ladies and gentlemen, as he comes past, please show your appreciation. As we said, the pilots do appreciate it. You genuinely can see this and, you know, wave and scream and shout, and uh, it is appreciated. And if you want to find out more about Sally B, just Google Sally B, how to help, and help keep this venerable old lady in the air, where she does a magnificent job commemorating all of those people that were lost. Oh, it's a tail down. Oh, it's a tail low. Yeah, but here he is. is. <laughs> and pushing, yeah, keep yeah, pushing your tail stick. down, forward to level. Yeah, here he is, pushing, keep the tail up. There you are, ladies and gentlemen. What, what a wonderful piece of living history. And for long as it's there, we shall remember. You are? Now, ladies and gentlemen, just as interesting, having had the B-17 flying, 
Uh, have a look out. Uh, when you look up either way, whichever way it comes from, and see the 109, the Bouchon coming, uh, when you see that aeroplane, if you see it and you just catch it up and it's quite small, the chances are you would have already been dead if you'd left it that long in World War II. You needed to see things a long way out. But here he is now running in from the left, Steve Jones in the Bouchon, the Spanish built 109. Like the wine, you can imagine that coming through the side door of the U17 and opening up with the 50 cows. Cartridges flying around in front of your face. Fascinating. Again with that raspier sound from the Merlin. Not, of course, as we had <laughs> that it would have had a Merlin originally. So in 1942, the Spanish government arranged a manufacturing license to build the 109G2 with Daimler Benz DB605A engines with propellers, instruments and weapons to be supplied from Germany. This was proved impossible as Germany was incapable of meeting her own needs, let alone Spain's. And in the event, only 25 aircraft, uh, minus their tails, and a less than complete set of engineering drawings were delivered. Post-war, things were different. They were in production. The first ones had substituted the 1300 horsepower Hispano Suiza engine. Now Melvin will see it, it was even made with the fit bar, in fact two different marks of fit bar. So in terms of combat, this against the spit bar, now if I remember the 109 should outfly the spit bar in a dive, but in a turning circle. The yeah, spit it, would outfly the... Yeah, the Spitfire could turn tighter, the Hurricane can turn tighter still. Yep. Uh, but in a diving, because they had fuel-injected Daimler Benz engines, they could push the stick and dive away. With the carburetor in the, uh, the Spitfire, when they went to negative G, it cut power for a little yep, while. Absolutely. So they had the advantage, and they were also slightly faster in the dive. The next version developed in Spain had a larger Hispano engine, and they first flew in uh, 1951. And they were armed with either one or two 12.7 millimeter machine guns and Pilatus eight packs of 80 millimeter rockets. There go. The final variant was this one, the HA1112 M1L, the you Bouchon, don't get much in there. which uh, was powered by so uh, a Rolls Royce yeah. engine of Rolls Royce Merlin of 1600 horsepower. Shame. Both the engines and the propellers being purchased from the UK. The interesting thing around that is it took the story full circle because the very prototype um, Bechersmith 109 flew in May 1935, some 10 months before the Spitfire, powered by a Rolls-Royce Kestrel engine. Well, you can see particularly uh, in the dive what a tremendous performance it had. It picked up speed very, very quickly, even with the Merlin engine in it. Uh, also, of course, it was fitted with wing slats. So lower speed handling was improved by the handy page slats popping out. A couple of anties though, uh, take off and landing, that little nasty towed in cat 4 undercarriage was one thing, but also the cockpit 